When I was very young, I read the Bible. No, I mean I read the Bible, cover to cover. Each night before I went to bed, no matter how exhausted I was, I read a page. It was like a self-imposed mandate, some kind of disciplinary ritual that I thought would bring me closer to the divine, whatever that was. At 12, I was already experiencing some form of existential angst. I wondered what the meaning of life was, what I was here for, how the stories I was reading related to my own life. You know, give it a purpose, a deeper meaning. At the time, I was living in Brazil, and although I'd become acclimated to a very different culture, on the surface, it all seemed pretty much the same. Another fast-paced metropolis with a million people moving in a thousand directions. Until I stumbled upon a site on an afternoon walk with my family. I had been skipping ahead of everyone on a gravel path when I saw it. A sacred site of sorts. Candles were burning. Sticks and other materials were neatly arranged. The sandy ground was stained dark red and unrecognizable animal parts took center stage. Was this voodoo? What exactly was voodoo? An outdoor room had been carved out of the dense jungle foliage. This clearing had served as a special place where activities of otherworldliness had taken place, a type of communion with something beyond this world. Who were these people? Most importantly, what did they believe? It dawned on me, whatever they believed was very different from the belief systems I had come to know and the rituals my family and community had practiced. I became increasingly curious about other cultures and what their rituals looked like. I pored over my parents' piles of National Geographics to learn about faraway places and different religious traditions. Eventually graduating from my parents' living room, I began spending endless hours at the library studying philosophy and spiritualism. Certainly books held the answers to my insatiable spiritual quest. Questions of the divine, what was considered sacred, and what other ways of being were possible continued. I became intrigued with East Asian cultures, cultures that celebrated many gods and those that had no god. I continued to be very curious about how we bring the sacred into the everyday, so that the sacred is not always over there, outside ourselves, but instead is here and now in our presence, in our thoughts, our speech, and our actions. The philosophy of Buddhism resonated deeply with me. The first supposition, life is suffering, was a concept I could relate to. Certainly the extreme poverty I'd witnessed in Sao Paulo and my own existential crisis and depression seemed this way. The idea that all things are impermanent also seemed to hold wisdom. And the practices of being mindful Responding to adversity with wisdom and compassion was one I could embrace. I learned to meditate, I practiced chanting, and took yoga lessons. An overland pilgrimage from Kathmandu to Lhasa, Tibet, the former residence of the Dalai Lama, gave me an opportunity to experience firsthand the traditions of Buddhism and the places where these cultural traditions once flourished. I imagined this long, circuitous trek from Nepal to Tibet and back again as a type of mandala inscribed on the landscape. In the Buddhist tradition, a mandala represents the Buddhist cosmology. As a visual diagram, practitioners use it for meditation purposes, circumambulating the concentric rings as a spiritual journey. Akin to navigating a mandala, my trek across the Tibetan plateau was a transformative experience emotionally, physically, and spiritually. In Nepal, people greeted us by raising their hands to their hearts and bowing their heads gently while saying namaste. While in Tibet, the same gesture was accompanied with the word Taji Dele. Both can be poetically translated as, I see the divine light within you. Religious beliefs, narratives, origin stories, and even greetings perpetuate beliefs, giving form to culture, and providing people on an identity, a community of like-minded people, and a set of values and principles to live by. But these cultural distinctions also differentiate us and tend to divide us, rather than unify us and nourish our humanity. It is often thought that in Buddhist tradition, the goal is to attain enlightenment, to break away from an endless cycle of birth, death and rebirth, and the trouble and suffering that are inevitably a part of, well, life. But in fact, 
There is no goal, no attainment or place to arrive. Rather, like life, Buddhism is a process, a process of being aware of our interdependence and our connectedness at every moment. So I've come to believe that at every moment, there is an opportunity to respond open-heartedly to the situation at hand, to let emotions be without attaching to them, as these two will pass, and to practice integrating mind, body, and spirit. This path is a daily practice of creating sacred space. It is a long, winding path of self-discovery. Although more challenging than it sounds, it is worth the practice. <laughs>